as the organization is not the strongest point. Anyhow, uh, good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Desmond Lochman, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event uh, featuring Ndaba Mandela, uh, who will be sharing with us lessons that he learned from his grandfather, uh, the legendary leader in South Africa, who is also one of the most inspirational world leaders of the 20th uh, century. Uh, I'm also grateful uh, that we were able to organize this event with uh, Diane Wallace Booker, uh, who is executive director of US Dream Academy, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that she'll tell us a little about, uh, whose primary mission is to empower those children uh, most at risk of incarceration uh, to believe in themselves and to succeed. Uh, I'm also pleased uh, that we have with us uh, Terry Warrior, who is the co-founder with Ndaba uh, of the Nelson Mandela Leadership Accelerator, whose ambitious goal is to attract uh, and mentor uh, by 2008 100 Mandela centennial leaders uh, who will try to perpetuate the legacy of Nelson Mandela in Africa. Uh, an event of the lessons to be learned from Nelson Mandela uh, would always be most welcome. Uh, however, it seems to me that it's particular to be welcomed uh, in today's troubled time of rising racism, uh, bigotry, and anti-immigrant sentiment, not just in the United States, uh, but in all too many places around the globe. Uh, it's also timely to do an event uh, like we're doing today, coming as it does uh, so soon after South Africans general election uh, on Wednesday uh, after 25 years of majority rule in South Africa. Uh, as Ndaba reminds us uh, in his uh, fascinating memoir, uh, Going to the Mountain, uh, which is available outside uh, for sale, uh, among the hallmarks of his legendary grandfather were his finely honed skills at mediation and reconciliation uh, as well as his message of hope. Uh, if ever we needed world leaders with those skills, uh, with that message of hope, it has to be uh, today. Uh, very much following in his grandfather's footsteps, Ndaba is an outspoken influencer and change agent on the African continent and in the arena of international politics. Together with his cousin, Kweku Mandela, he co-founded Africa Rising, a nonprofit foundation dedicated to promoting a positive image of Africa around the globe and to increasing its potential for growth in the areas of education, employment, and international uh, corporate alliances for profit and partnership. In its first 10 years, African Rising has launched projects taking on AIDS, youth unemployment, and education. Ndaba also serves as an executive director for UN AIDS, which seeks to end discrimination against HIV AIDS and as I have already mentioned, together with Terry Warrior, he is working on the ambitious goal of building 100 Mandelas through a leadership program designed around the principles and proactive strategies embodied by Nelson Mandela. I am very much looking forward to what Ndaba will be telling us, as well as to the conversation that we'll be having after uh, his talk with Diane Wallace Booker and Terry Warrior. Uh, before calling Ndaba uh, to make his remarks, uh, we're just going to play a short video, uh, and directly after that, uh, I'll ask Ndaba uh, to come to the stage. But please well, join me in welcoming Ndaba Mandela to our stage. My grandfather was not afraid of the truth. Nelson Mandela instead spoke out loudly and with dignity. His only surviving son had died of AIDS. It has been 11 years since my father passed away. I would have loved to see the look on his eyes today as I address the opening of this historical meeting in this historical place. From a young age, my grandfather put the pressure on me to make me understand what my role is. Daba, you're my grandfather. We are peacekeepers. 
Therefore, people will look at you as a leader. I didn't want that. I just wanted to be a normal kid. I just wanted to be like everyone else. I don't want to be a leader, but this is my role and responsibility. My name is Ndav Mandela. I am from South Africa. Grew up in Soweto, southwest of Johannesburg, where they moved the black people to. And I would always witness these cops, these police coming to the neighborhood, raiding people, harassing people. And so I wanted to hit back. But we all know that Nelson Mandela never did that. One of the things he says that in order to defeat your enemy, you must work with your enemy because then he becomes your partner, maybe even your friend. When you operate from a position of love and understanding, then you will be able to achieve anything. You will be able to overcome. But of course, there must be patience in that as well. It's not going to come overnight. But ultimately, that is what will allow us to reach a place where we can understand each other, where we can communicate openly, be honest, and grow. I'm proud to be who I am, and I am not happy with the state of Africa. And I feel that I must do something, I must contribute to making sure that Africa is in a better place. And I thought to myself, wouldn't this world that we live in today be a better world if we had a hundred Mandela's? I am a global citizen. What I can dream, I can achieve. Together, with these hands, we can make a better world. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How's everyone feeling today? Feeling good? Good? So, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the history of our country, of South Africa. But you're not aware of the viciousness and the brutality of the system of which I come from. A system so brutal, in fact, that if they had to find out a child was born from a mixed-race couple, they would remove that child from both parents and put that child in an area of just mixed-race people. Now, if you can do that to a family, to an innocent soul, what can you do to a living person? Right? But lucky for me, I did not have to experience the hardcore brutality because I grew up with my grandmother in the Eastern Cape. And the first time I met my grandfather, my parents said, hey, we're going to go meet your grandfather in jail. And so as a seven-year-old, I had a typical image of what jail would be, you know, concrete bars, dogs, security everywhere. But when I got there, it was a house. Nothing like what I had imagined. A house more beautiful than the one I lived in. Because I didn't understand that they had removed Nelson Mandela from Robben Island and put him in this house called Victor Vista, where they were lining him up, right, to be released. But they were trying to break him down mentally to say, Madiba, you're an old man now. Give up the fight against apartheid. 
give up this organization of yours called the ANC, denounce your comrades, live the rest of your life in luxury, and we will make sure that you get to play with your grandchildren for the rest of your days. And of course, we all know that didn't happen. Madiba, Madiba stood strong in his beliefs. And so when we got there, I saw a swimming pool. I never had a swimming pool. I met a chef for the very first time who had such amazing food. I watched The Never Ending Story. And of course, we met the man himself, tall, dark, handsome gentleman. And he greeted every one of us with enthusiasm and love and excitement. Hi, how are you? What's your name? What's your favorite subject at school? And that was the first time I had an idea of what I wanted to do when I grew up. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I didn't want to be a doctor. I said, when I grow up, I want to go to jail. <laughs> right? Because this was jail to me. Just a few weeks later, the old man came out and the whole world was in celebration. And I didn't see my grandfather for three years. I went back to my normal life growing up in the hood in Soweto. So one day after school, I'm playing marbles with my friends and black BMW pulls up. Out jumps the man, the driver, suit on, comes directly to me, says, hey, are you in Daba? I said, yes. He says, I've been sent by your grandfather to come and fetch you. Come, let's go. I'm like, stranger danger. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not going with you. And um, he says, do you have any idea who your grandfather is? Do you want me to get fired? I said, no, sir, I am not going with you. Eventually, the man gave up and he left. And when my father came home later that evening, I told him what had transpired. And he said, well, if the man comes again, you should go with him. Lo and behold, the man came back later that week. And so I went with him. And off we went to the leafy white northern suburbs of Johannesburg and Houghton. And of course, we roll up to this gate and it's a huge electronic gate opens and wow, it's a big house and there's security and there's staff and there's people in the kitchen and there's people in the garden and it's, wow, I'm like, Jesus, where are we right now? And they take me to the lounge and my grandfather comes and he says, Ndaba, I am sending your parents to university because your father never had the opportunity to go to university. And I don't want them to worry about you, so I want them to focus on their books, and while they are there, you will come and stay with me. I will take care of you while your parents are at school. And you know, in the African home, you don't ask questions. You just say yes. Yes, ma'am, no ma'am, yes, ma'am, no ma'am. That's it, done. And so I moved in with my grandfather. So my father went to school went to university for the first time at the age of 45. And he became a lawyer at the age of 50. And he died at the age of 55. HIV AIDS took his life. And so my family came together to discuss what we we're going to tell the world of how my father had passed away. And so my one cousin said, well, we can say pneumonia or TB killed him because HIV AIDS doesn't kill you, it kills your immune system, so you're unable to defend yourself against common colds and disease. And my grandfather said, no, we shall not do that. We shall simply say, my son was killed by HIV AIDS, full stop. And so we went out there, press conference, my grandfather sat down, read a statement, and we all stood behind him. And that was the first time a big family had told the world, South Africa, of the true nature of why my father had died. Because there was a huge stigma, and thank God that stigma is dying. But our work has to continue. The stigma is that HIV AIDS is the only disease that has actually come with a moral question, right? that you got this disease because you have been engaging in unsanitary behavior. You have been doing promiscuous behavior, etc., etc. right? 
And so people were afraid to disclose their status. And so people were dying in silence, right? Dying alone, unable to tell their friends and their family, their loved ones, what was happening. And so this gave people the courage to start talking about this epidemic openly. Gave people the courage to tackle this disease on an open platform and treat it like any other disease. And that was the real message my grandfather was trying to tell the world, to say that, let us stop hiding. We have to be open about this thing if we want to defeat this thing. And so when UN AIDS came and asked me to be their ambassador, I was the ambassador. I was never the executive director. I was the ambassador, global ambassador for about eight years. I stopped last year. Of course, it was a no-brainer. And we went to Brazil and we went to Russia and we went to a number of places talking to at-risk people, sex workers, orphanages, young people, people at the stadiums, people having fun. Um, to say, let us protect the goal. Let us protect the goal. Let us make sure that AIDS does not score a goal. Right? We're using soccer as an analogy. Let us not allow AIDS to score a goal. Protect the goal. Right? Protect yourself. Protect your partner. Protect your loved ones. Protect your dreams. Protect your future. Right? Because in South Africa, we have a government that would spend approximately $80 on educating the white child, $10 on educating the black child. So you can imagine 27 years of incarceration, 27 years later, we are still picking up the pieces. And so it is important, it is imperative, it is my duty, it is my obligation, it is my responsibility to make sure I do what I can to make sure that these young people have a chance to dream, can see themselves in the future, and are not ravaged by this disease. We have a generation today in South Africa of child-headed households. A 13-year-old looking after their 9-year-old sibling, looking after their 5-year-old sibling, looking after their 2-year-old sibling. Now, what kind of a job is a 13-year-old going to get? Definitely not a normal job. These are the things that perpetuate the social ills of our society. That is why we have to do what we have to do, ladies and gentlemen. And what have we chosen to do? We have chosen to work with young people in the impoverished areas, in the rural areas, in the farms, right? To give them some education, to give them some skills, to give them some tools because we have to break the cycle of poverty that exists. So we do education, we do technology, we do career guidance, we do agriculture programs. Last year, for example, we did a three-month coding program with Oracle for about 60 kids, 40 high school kids, 20 unemployed youth. Youth unemployment being one of the key challenges, not only in South Africa, but across the continent. Because our kids in my village finish high school without even touching a computer. Now, how are we, as an organization, going to build an, a new generation that's at the forefront of Africa's development so they can be the principal beneficiaries of the development taking place? Not multinational corporations, the people first. Right? And so it is important that I am here to be able to talk to you, to build partnerships, to build bridges, so that we can go back home and spend time in making sure that young people have access to information and have the tools that they need so that they can realize and understand that they are the masters of their destiny. That is our role, to make sure that young people dream big and they dream every, very big. And I want to encourage you 
to also dream big. And I want you to dream so big that your dreams scare you. Because if your dreams don't scare you, you are not dreaming big enough. Martin Luther King had a dream. JFK had a dream. Rosa Parks. Frederick Douglass. It all begins with a dream. And so we have to protect the dreams of our young people because they are the only ones who can promise tomorrow. And so I encourage all of you to become mentors of some person, young, who is at risk. And who are the people at most risk? Those are the people whose parents are incarcerated. Because when you become a mentor, you make a difference in somebody's life forever. You actually make somebody a better person. You are now making somebody who's going to add value to your community, to society, who are creating a better world for the future. That is what you do when you become a mentor. So, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much, and I look forward to engaging with you. Thank you. Well, I really must thank Ndaba for those inspirational uh, message that he's given and uh, that uh, he is a true standard bearer of the Mandela name. And uh, I really must compliment you on that. Thank you. But before I ask you a question, uh, I'm going to give you a rest uh, and just ask Diane, <laughs> perhaps if... Uh, I thought it was high five. But I'm a different generation, so what do I know? Uh, um, but if I could ask Diane just to mention a little bit about what her institute does here in the United States, the uh, Dream US Academy, uh, and perhaps uh, just give us some kind of indication of what the Mandela legacy might mean to you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So the US Dream Academy is, our work is around the country. We are an after school and mentoring program for children who have parents incarcerated and other kids falling behind in school. We very specifically locate in really high risk communities in order to create new pathways of access for young people to high quality educational opportunities, to mentoring, as Daba referenced, mentoring is a key part of the work that we do. And we are really based around three pillars, skill building, character building, and dream building. And so in the communities where we are, there is oftentimes little access to the types of support and resources that young people need to be able to thrive. And so our work is across the country. We're here in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Houston, Orlando, Indianapolis, where else? Salt Lake City. We just opened in San Bernardino. We're going to be expanding to Chicago. So we're really excited to be able to partner with um, Africa Rising and the Mandela family around this global idea of really empowering youth to be global leaders. And in South Africa, as you mentioned, 27 years now, a little over a generation, their young people are really still struggling with how do we break out of these systems of oppression. Many of our young people, and particularly in high-risk communities and minority young people, are still struggling with the same kinds of questions. How do we break out of cycles of poverty? How do we still you know, cast off these systems of oppression in our own communities to become the kind of leaders and live up to the, to the vision and values of the American dream? And when I was in South Africa, I had an opportunity to bring groups of American kids and South African young people together and to see the bonding and the sharing and the growth and development of these two groups of young people around the same age on two different continents coming from two very, very different income levels, but both of them of you know, African descent, African Americans, and of course Africans, um, bonding in a very quick and deep way and an understanding that they're struggling with the same thing and the sharing and learning that went on, even in that day long that they spent together, uh, really inspired me to say, how do we do this for more of our young people? And how do we grow and learn from each other in different continents? And so being able to partner with uh, the Mandela family, with Nadaba, and the legacy that they have, not only in South Africa, but around the world, um, I think is going to really elevate this message of how we help, as you said, our young people 
to lead us into the future, into a better future for, for not only America, but for the, for the world. Terry, thank you, Diane. Uh, Terry, would you like to just say a brief word about what you're doing with Africa's Talking? Okay, sure. Teddy. Uh, thank Teddy. you, guys. Teddy. My name, uh, Teddy. Yeah, my name is uh, Teddy Warrior. I was named after Teddy the Rough Rider, Roosevelt, <laughs> who, <laughs> who was your president. <laughs> uh, by no means, I'm not an American. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Kenyan who, came, who I come from the cradle of mankind. And uh, I'm glad to be here. When I, I used to be at school here at Bard College and, uh, in Princeton for 10 years, I stayed in America. And uh, I'm a believer in free enterprise and uh, willing buyer, willing seller. So I'm happy to be here. And just in brief, we started a company in a dorm room at MIT. My two co-founders started Africa Stocking in 2007 when most tech companies were started in America, including Facebook. There was a buzz. Every college student wanted to create a, an app or a tech company. So we didn't want to miss out on that bandwagon. So we created Africa Stocking. And in the earlier days, we used to say Africa Stocking. Africa is talking. We would ask our customers, and then they will respond, are you listening? <laughs> and uh, so Africa Stocking, in short, now is in 21 countries. We have unified all the telcos in Africa in one unified platform within eight years. It's never been done before. We're the pioneers of that. So we have literally connected Africa. We have created a sandbox and a platform for software developers across Africa to build any imaginable app uh, possible. So we're very proud that uh, we've been able to do that. And that indicates that we're also shifting our minds because Africa rising is also a state of mind. And this is a state of a beautiful mind, not pictures that you see on certain advertisements on TV about Africans with running noses and all that. We, we want to be beautiful. We want to think beautifully and we want to create great products. So Africa Stocking created a product that now the company, 10% of it was bought by IFC uh, World Bank from the United States and Orange Telecom of France. Uh, they gave us $8.6 million for a 10% stake. So it is possible. So even what Ndaba is talking about in Africa Rising and what you're doing there, we really literally want to create also 100 Mandela's. 50 of them hopefully will become, will create 50 blue chip African companies, and hopefully 50 of them will become Mandela-like presidents uh, who will change Africa for the next 50 to 100 years. So that's really the dream, and I believe dreams can be realized and uh, hopes can be fulfilled. And because of the dreams that I had, uh, Dan here has been very happy to partner with us. And I actually met her at an airport because her son was carrying a djembe drum. And I come from the drum beating people who are the Luo people of Kenya. So that's the reason I'm on this platform. And thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you very much, Teddy. Uh, and Daba, perhaps uh, what would be really good would be to get your impression of what happened in the recent general election. You know, it looks like the support for the ANC is waning, that there seems to be disappointment that they really haven't delivered after 25 years. I'm not sure whether you share that uh, kind of perspective, but maybe if you could just tell us what needs to change or you know, what is going right, what's going wrong uh, in terms of the ANC. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a good thing that they're Support is waning. I hope this is a a warning uh, shot uh, that is sent to the ANC because we have come from a, a very dark spell with our former president Jacob Zuma. Um, I think we all have heard of Jacob Zuma in the past couple of years and the kinds of things he has been up to. Uh, you know, he was working very closely with an Indian family not even South African citizens, who, you know, they say captured the state. And they really did, they really did. Um, so for me, I think it should be a wake up call for our party, um, because there's been too many corruption, allegations, scandals, um, 
And, you know, these people who are in positions of power have just not taken their job seriously because they are not there to fill up their pockets. They're there to deliver services to the people. <clears throat> and so they have not evolved, you know, from a liberation movement, right? We're there to fight for the rights of people. But now you're in a position of actually serving the people. Um, I don't believe they've evolved. And they have to get more young people involved to form part of the decision-making process uh, in order for us to truly be able to transform and look after the interest of the people because our people need a lot. Black people have been traumatized and we have not had the opportunity to, to go to council or to get counsel. You see, you know, hey, hey, let's go, let's go, let's move, let's move, let's move, you know? There's no time to talk, to be in your emotions, right? But they've done amazing things. You know, we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was led by Nelson Mandela and Bishop Tutu, which was very, very important. A lot of people say, what did it achieve? It hasn't done anything. We're still experiencing racism. You know, the whites still don't want to transform. I say, you know, but it did, it did achieve something very important. And that is when we brought the perpetrators of apartheid together with the victims to be able to sit on the same table and to discuss the atrocities of the past, that perpetrator can say, yes, what I did was wrong, right? And we gave them amnesty so that they can disclose everything to say, I killed those people because I was told by my captain to kill those people. And now I feel ashamed and now I feel sorry because I can see the damage, the hurt, the anger, the pain that I have caused onto this family, onto these people. And you give the opportunity for that victim to also then express those emotions to the perpetrator. You understand? So we're acknowledging something that was wrong. You are taking responsibility, right? Because if we have an argument and you say that this is a table and I say, no, this is a chair, right? We cannot continue going forward in that discussion unless we agree on the facts. The facts have to be acknowledged by both parties, right? In order for us to reach some point, some conclusion about the future, right? So that is the important thing that this country of America has not been able to do, right? We had the Emancipation Proclamation, right? Okay, everybody's free. Let's keep it moving. Let's go building. Let's go back to work. No. No. Let us take a moment to talk about the atrocities that were committed in this country because there is a huge white elephant in the room that we just keep walking over, keep walking around and, and under and on the side, right? Shaking the table. And so we're going to continue seeing this ugly head of prejudice, racism, rearing its head in this country until we sit down and acknowledge the atrocities that have taken place in this country. It's in the best interest of this country. You understand what I'm saying? So we have built thousands of houses in South Africa for poor people given people free houses, thousands of them. It's the only country in the world, only country in the world, who have built thousands of houses and given it to people who have never had houses before, right? We have the Black Economic Empowerment Policy, right? Where we say, if a company wants to do business with the government, it needs to have a minimum 24% black ownership. Otherwise, you cannot get a government contract, right? So these are the great things that our country has, has done. We have a generation now they call black diamonds, right? Very wealthy black people in South Africa, right? That is a good thing. I love to see my brothers and sisters driving Ferraris and popping bottles, as they say, yes. right? Yes. I love it. But we have to make sure that it's done within a proper context. We're just not doing it for the sake of doing it, but it's an achievement. We are celebrating something that we have achieved, right? Not because we're watching MTV rap, no. 
It's because we're achieving, and that's what we need to teach our children, right? So that they don't get carried away by this instant gratification of social media, right? right? Uh, Share much of what you said, you know, particularly, uh, you know, I think that the miracle of the transition, you know, that the reconciliation process, you know, was truly a miracle that you could have a transition of that sort without the country, you know, totally falling apart, particularly after all of the atrocities uh, no that have war. occurred. No civil war. I think that that is, you know, somebody wrote a book about it, you know, with the title Anatomy of a Miracle. You know, what Nelson Mandela did, you know, is truly great. Uh, on the black empowerment, you know, I've got trouble, you know, when I read after 25 years, income inequality in South Africa is still increasing, you know, that this is the country that is the worst in the world. And I'm just not sure that enriching a handful of people does much for the millions of people uh, who uh, are struggling with electricity or water or whatever. You know, that it, it seems that the ANC uh, uh, hasn't really uh, delivered. But I'm just curious whether, you know, you've got hope that with somebody like Cyril Ramaphosa, who uh, was your grandfather's preferred choice uh, rather than Tom and Becky to lead the country, that now he's in power. Have you got hope that the kind of changes that you're talking about, you know, getting young people involved, being more responsive, uh, are you hopeful that that uh, uh, is going to take place? I am very hopeful that it will take place. And I'm very happy that we still have a handful of very rich people. I think that's a very good thing. I think that's a beautiful thing. Yes, we have those disparities, but those disparities exist all over the world. I mean, I heard the other day that the most expensive apartment in New York went for $280 million. You talk about economic disparities and inequality, you're looking at the country. You will hear have those disparities. I couldn't, I couldn't. You understand what I'm saying? I so couldn't. let's not point fingers at my people yeah. because you have those very same challenges right here at home. No, I couldn't in agree with you. I, 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 couldn't what I, mean? I couldn't agree with you more, but you know, I think as uncomfortable as we feel about inequality in uh, South Africa, we should feel, feel more so about the disparities, you know, which lead to politics uh, that uh, could be really troubling. Terry, right. Teddy. Thank you. So uh, I'm speaking of this uh, as an African who observes also South Africa. And uh, I'd like to give a little bit of context. So for every new black uh, BEE uh, entrepreneur who makes this money, typically you have almost 17 to 20 people who depend on you because we as Africans, we live in extended families. I am the 10th of 17 children from a polygamous East African family. And my siblings on average have at least four kids. They don't call me uncle. My brother's kids call me little daddy. Exactly. Okay, because mm -hmm. I'm a little daddy to them. And then my, I call my mother's sisters my mothers. I don't call them auntie. Okay, I call my half brothers and sisters my brothers and sisters because that's our context. So these rich men and women who are making this money is trickling down to entire villages. So it's not one man, one show, one wealth. The wealth is shared. So we believe in a shared uh, economy. So I just wanted to give that context. Then secondly, for the African National Congress, most of the comrades or veterans of leaders of uh, African National Congress, some of them are in their late 60s or early 70s because they fought the long fight. And in my culture, we believe in giving the elders their time. It doesn't mean that uh, they won't uh, fade away and leave, but they're also training and passing on the baton to the other younger leaders. So the, pro uh, the proposal that we will made to President Cyril Ramaphosa and others is like, Hopefully, he can have a, a, a cabinet of 
50% younger people, 50% older people above 65. Something like that, to start helping the young ones have new seats, I mean, same table, but new seats of leaders. But again, the young people, the leadership will not be handed to them. It was never handed to Nelson Mandela. He claimed it. It was never handed to Ndaba Mandela. He has claimed it. And even in my country, to also just give you context, uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta, the leadership wasn't given to him. He claimed it. So you must claim the leadership. And that's what part of the 100 Mandelas will be doing, is to create a blueprint of how the young leaders can claim, take, and hold the leadership to change and transform Africa once and for all. Awesome. Before I turn to the audience, uh, maybe uh, if you could just give us some indication of how much progress is being made in fighting AIDS in South Africa. You know, that, like what you mentioned in your speech, uh, is really shocking that a 13-year-old has to take care of the siblings. You know, South Africa uh, is one of the countries where you've had most, uh, the highest incidence of AIDS. Is there much progress being made in dealing with it? Or, you know, what are the lessons that were learned from past mistakes? You know, is there reason for optimism that, you know, AIDS uh, is really going to be dealt with properly in South Africa? Yes, um, there has been significant progress that has been made uh, as far as the fight against HIV AIDS is concerned. Uh, today, a, a person who, you know, does a test and finds out that they are HIV positive can get treatment, there is antiretroviral treatment that is free, provided by the government. Um, you know, the HIV rate, um, I remember in tertiary education, we went from 25% to 13%. So we are, we are making strides. But unfortunately, um, you know, the, the age which was 21 to 40, which was the most affected, is going down. But now you have the 16 to 20 year olds, or is it 14 to 20 year olds, which is now spiking. You know, it's younger people are getting affected. Um, so the fight needs to continue. One of the problems is that people are very scared to get tested, right? So there are actually kits now that are available. And we are now embarking uh, on a on a program and a campaign where we're gonna be getting these kits and making sure that we distribute them around to people. Basically, it's a kit where you're able to test yourself. You don't have to prick yourself. You take a swab of your mouth and um, you put it to the testing element and you know there's directions step by step. And in 20 minutes, you will know your HIV status. And that is amazing because once you're on the antiretroviral treatment, you cannot spread the AIDS virus anymore. And so we can actually defeat this disease in the next 10 years if we really put our efforts into making sure that everybody gets their status tested. They know their status. It's, that's what it starts with, right? And making sure that obviously you, you use protection. But there have been significant strides. I mean, obviously there was the huge sort of uh, what can I say? Scandal or with Tabumbeki, yes. right? Because he held off against bringing in the antiretroviral treatment because he was questioning the relationship between HIV and AIDS, right? And and asking maybe it's poverty is a thing that actually makes HIV persist and become AIDS, uh, but. He lost that argument, and now everybody's got access to treatment. Oh, that's really encouraging to hear. Teddy. Thank you, Ndaba, uh, for that. One of the things that I also co connect with Ndaba is that a lot of people in Eastern Cape had passed on with HIV AIDS when it was a real plague in Africa. And also in my place in Western Kenya, we'd lost a lot of people in the 90s and the 2000s. So they, we have also a lot of household uh, 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 kids uh, running households. But what I want to say, because we are here, and, and now is that uh, I want to give tribute to the former President George uh, 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 Walker Bush for instituting uh, something called PEPFAR that saved uh, millions of lives, and uh, it endears me to him. And uh, 
And, uh, and, and so if you can pass on a message that he did right for, by Africa by doing that, mm. and uh, it's, it's probably an enduring legacy to him. And the, his helping with, the, with PEPFAR did not only help HIV AIDS, it also helped eliminate ma malaria in some parts of Africa, simply because the health systems were strengthened. It also helped fix tuberculosis because also health systems were strengthened. And because of the food program that came with the drugs, it also helped take care of anemia. So, so he attacked different points of the, our primary healthcare system with that particular intervention that was also urged on him by the former secretary Condoleezza Rice. So we're very thankful uh, for that. And uh, we've continued to, to, we hope that we'll see an AIDS-free generation within the next 10 to 20 years. It's something we really want to, to push as well. Thank you for that. Uh, why don't I just use the remaining time that we've got uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, if uh, you do have questions, you know, if I ask you not to make too long a comment and come to question, and also if you could just identify who you are. Uh, just the microphone will come. Hello, my name is Alex. My question is, how does the leadership lessons from Nelson Mandela aid, if any, in the change from a government fighting for liberation to a government fighting for, to provide services for their population? And how does business get, uh, interact effectively with government in making that transition? Yes, so it's unfortunate that a lot of people, including our leaders, hail Nelson Mandela but they don't follow in his footsteps. They don't learn the lessons of Nelson Mandela. Hence, I had to write this book to remind them about the lessons of Nelson Mandela. You know, um, when we talk about how to deal with your enemies, because the problem is with that older generation is that they are still stuck with the colonial battle, right? So they're very much unable to accept that they've made mistakes in the face of their colonial, former colonial masters, right? So we will put in uh, affirmative action, right? Regardless whether that person is competent or not, right? Where our generation is more on merit, right? We want the best person for the job, regardless of their skin color. The older generation, they don't operate like that, right? They want their black people, no matter what. No matter what. I don't care about putting our black people there. So they are still trying to, you know, get it together. They're still, you know, trying. But people like Cyril, they get it, you know. He's young enough. Um, he's, he's in a generation below. You know, he's like in the middle between our grandparents and us. Mm -hmm. So he understands the best man for the job. But... At the same time, we have to make sure that we train our people, right? We have to put our young people first. Our government is still not putting our, gov our, our young people first. You understand? So our government, we love Madiba, hail Madiba, but are not walking like Madiba. Nice. So that's why I've written this book to remind them. And hopefully, when I start engaging with them on a serious level, they will. And I believe in Cyril, and so I have great hope in the future. Uh, of our country. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank Daba. You. Actually, Daba is wearing a very cool T-shirt written a long walk to freedom, because <laughs> freedom is just beginning, exactly. uh, 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 and we are taking it uh, very seriously. So, picking back on what he said about Mandela, a lot of leaders talk that they, are, they, they follow Mandela, they want to be like Mandela, but you cannot follow and be like Mandela if you don't have the habits of Mandela. So it begins uh, with even the habits. And one of the simple habits of Mandela, uh, as some of you may know, he used to also make his bed in, a, in, a, in an orderly way. A lot of people just jump out of bed. They don't even make the bed in the morning. And, and they start their day on a wrong foot. I'm just trying to give you this so that you see the idea of habits. Uh, Mandela learned the language of his oppressors. He, if you learn somebody's language, you also learn their culture, what they like, what they don't like. And you also learn how to engage them. And in fact, you even, might even learn what food they like so that when you invite them for dinner to talk with him, you present him with the food that he likes. 
I'm just giving this as very basic uh, things uh, so, so that you know. And, uh, and, and what Mandela did also, he reached out to so many people, old and young, rich or poor, so that people around the world have asked in five continents what they think about Mandela, even strangers that I didn't know. They've written for me beautiful things about of the man and the person of Mandela, including somebody who met her at an elevator right here in DC, who I did, know, I did not know they had the, the, the exact time they had met Mandela, but he said the humility that he has posed, even on the staircase, by pressing the button for them to get into the staircase. And this time he was, he was above 75 years old, right here in DC. So they, so they wrote on my book. So imagine if your grandchildren talk well about you, your countrymen talk well about you, and the global citizens from all over the world talk well about you. Imagine the legacy and the person of who you are. So I believe uh, uh, in foundations, and Mandela, he did everything he could at the age he was to set the right foundations for South Africa. So it was up to the next generations to take the baton and run with it. Some of them failed to do that. And to your question of businesses, so I came to study in the US in, 20, in 2000 uh, on, a, on a scholarship, and uh, I helped, I've helped about 259 Kenyans to get into the Ivy League schools within the last 18 years. So what I did, I wrote a small practical guidebook called uh, uh, New Horizon, a practical guide to applying to colleges in the US. It was a 34-page uh, guidebook, and in 2001, when I was a freshman here, I brought in six Kenyans who went to MIT for the first time, okay? And I'm trying to give you the foundations of the, uh, a free enterprise. So these six people, out of the six, three remained in the United States. Two of them are lawyers in Wall Street right now, as we speak. Three of them came back home and they're my partners in Kenya. So I'm able to do this with Ndaba because one of them is currently my CEO. She's called Bilhan Dirango. We made her CEO about six months ago. The other one is called Sam Gikandi. He runs Africa's Talking Labs, where we are incubating 10 companies to become the next uh, African unicorns, because it's possible. Because right now, Africa's Talking is at $120 million. We build this company from 2010. So when I speak about us creating the 100 Mandelas, it's also born of the experience that I've already helped a lot of Kenyans to come to Ivy League schools, because I think I cracked the code in the right way. Not the style of people paying for their kids to go to college. No, 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 not that kind. I figured out what each of these colleges want and need, and I package all these students in this manner. And essentially, on the essays that they were writing, I was drawing what is their dream, and how can we help them realize that. So in what we'll be doing with uh, 100 Mandelas, we'll strictly be creating a process Organizations, we might have a beautiful name like Africa Rising, but that's not what will create change in Africa. The processes that we're going to put down from the habits and values and philosophies of Nelson Mandela to the new habits, values, and visions of Ndaba Mandela, because he represents the younger generation, yeah, who are technologically savvy and who are called the cheetah generation, will want to move at that speed that we can replicate and you can only replicate if you create processes. So that's what 100 Mandelas will do to, to, to create a process that will do that. And then ultimately, our dream is to be the bridge between Africans and African Americans so that once and for all, we can come to the table and sort out these historical, say, injustices or things that have been misunderstood for hundreds of years. We want to get started. And by, the, by divine providence, as it always happens, I am very fortunate that uh, President Barack Obama comes from where I come from in Kenya. Uh, Lupita Nyong'o, who did the play on the slavery on, on 12 something yes. uh, a slave, yes. happens to be f uh, from my mother's people who come from a place called Seme in Lake Victoria District. So all these things God has already given unto us. So claiming from the words of Nehemiah in the Bible, we want to be the Nehemiahs in a very humble way to create the next generation of young Africans who can bring the world back to Africa, right? And I know now some of you are doing it in simple ways by trying to say, let's go the organic way. So Ndaba and I enjoy beef because our cattle, they eat grass. 
they're not fed with any other thing. So it's just uh, grass, you know? So we're going back to the basics, and the basics in, is in Africa, right? So wear your own story, as I'm also wearing, and my lady has also put on a fantastic African dress, buy from Africa as well. That's the way we can move forward together in business, right? Thank you. If, maybe just in the interest of time, if we can collect a few questions. Aloha, my name's Kimberly Miyazawa Frank. I work for the Aspen Institute uh, for a policy program that is, um, it's an anti-poverty policy program working on lifting up and providing the needs of the whole family and all generations. And what I appreciate about the partnerships that you all have spoken about with your respective um, endeavors is that you are meeting kids, adults, um, college students, and you're creating this pipeline at all ages, and that is a beautiful thing. What I'd like to know more about is the 100 Mandela's and what the curriculum is, or not, so, not specifically the curriculum, but what is the, how are you training them? And I understand the culture and the discipline, Nelson Mandela, and the ritual, and that is really important, okay. the tradition, but then what else? And does that trickle down to the Dream Academy students? And how, you know, because that's a pipeline as well mm -hmm. in our country, and we could learn a lot, obviously, and apply a lot from Nelson Mandela. So I'm interested in that. Thank you. Absolutely. Is there anybody else uh, at good. the back? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for AEI for putting together this wonderful panel. My name is Claudia Körbler. I work for the World Bank Group by day, and I'm a global storyteller and filmmaker by night. Um, I really appreciate what the US Dream Academy and Africa Rising are doing, in particular in terms of youth empowerment and youth leadership. Um, I worked in a youth innovation fund in 2016 in the wetlands in South Africa, and we came in with a very small entrepreneurship grant of about $30,000. We provided literacy workshop, HIV prevention and public maternal health workshop to the girls of the age of 13 to 21 in the wetlands who suffer a lot of teen pregnancy and HIV and AIDS as well. Now we came in, we did a workshop for about three weeks, we operated people from the World Bank and from DC to go there, but then the issue we had afterwards is what happens in terms of sustainability. Like how can you bring and transfer knowledge to these communities, but then actually get local NGOs involved as well to kind of maintain this knowledge. So I would lurk, like to learn from the US Dream Academy and Africa Rising, what are you doing to create sustainability? What are some of the organizations you work together with and how can policymakers in particular in DC really try to help support the endeavors on the ground as well? Because I do feel that's where most of our knowledge gap comes from, where some of the disconnect is as well. So thank you for the work you're doing for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Take one more question. Thank you for being here today. My name is Michael Klein. I'm a student here in Washington. Um, I'm very grateful that you shared your insights because this isn't something I was very engaged with before, but I hope to be engaged with in the future. Um, so my question is brief. How would you guys feel about celebrity engagement, um, perhaps like the work of Bono and, and one in the likes of him? Um, do you think that they're effective in, in bringing an impact and bringing awareness, or do you feel that they um, maybe they have a disconnect with, with the people and the issues? I'm just curious to, to how you feel about that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and Dob, but do you want to, so there were three questions. <laughs> yes. One, 100 Mandela's, um, two, sustainability, and three, uh, celebrities. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have identified four key areas, right, in which we feel and believe we need to focus on in order for Africa to start realizing its road to independence. We say, Education and technology as one. We say energy and agriculture as two. We say healthcare and we say entrepreneurship development. Right? So, of course, there will be a criteria for the young people that we work with, mainly aiming at millennials between the ages of 18 to 30. Right? And we're going to start with a pilot that me and uh, Teddy are going to be running later this year because we want to launch this thing uh, next year. Um, where we're going to start with 10 young people, gender, 
equality is very important for us. Um, and so the first thing that they will learn is when they travel to our village where Nelson Mandela grew up and is, is laid to rest, is what are the characteristics and leadership style of, of Nelson Mandela? We say this is a man with great vision, great conviction and passion in what he believed in and the work that he was doing, right? He was a disciplined man, integrity, humility, huge value in public service, right? And from there, we will partner with corporates to then, obviously, also, we have to choose young people that are passionate about going into those four key areas so that they do a three to six month internship. And by the way, this is also, it's not written in stone. So we are, as we do the pilot, we're going to drill down and, and, and focus right. more, right? And of course, working with the Dream Academy as well, right? Um, they do their three to six month internship, and then from there they have to return to their respective communities and start a project, right? It may be a project that they apply to because one of the you know, questions is identify a challenge in your community and a potential solution, right? So they themselves are the ones coming up with the solutions to the challenges. But the difference is that they will have the assistance of the corporate that adopted them, right? to help them mobilize resources to run the project and to also mentor them. And they have to commit to mentoring the next group that come the next year. It's only the first ones that will have different mentors, but after that, they become mentors. So each group that comes through has to mentor the next group that comes through. So it's almost a peer-to-peer -peer kind of mentoring system that we have. Um, and for us, it's very important as far as sustainability is concerned. We work with um, organizations on the ground. We actually, we hardly implement the actual programs ourselves, right? We raise the money for it and we have the partnerships and make sure we have people on the ground. So we have a very um, sort of key gentleman, Pico. His name is Pico Lomzi, right? He has an organization called the UNU Youth Development, right, in our village that helps us navigate and understand what are the day-to-day -day challenges of those people, right? And so without them, we would not be really able to, to carry out these programs, right? So it is key for us that we have people on the ground that are able to communicate with us, who are able to run, you know, to coordinate, because it takes a lot of coordination. You need the community buy-in, you need to have the Department of Education, you need to have the government, you need to have a lot of coordination that goes into this. And without that, it's, it's really, you can't really do much. You know, you can only go so far. So that's where, for me, the sustainability is that you make sure that they, you empower the people, right, the elders, the people who are most educated, to be able to run the programs themselves. So that when you step away, the work continues. Whether you die or you don't, the work continues. Yeah. From a Dream Academy perspective, just to add on to that, that, yeah. that, that that's a key piece of right how we are really changing mindsets. So the young people themselves identifying the problems in their community that they want to change or help to enhance, not enhance a problem, but enhance a solution. Yep. Um, and that they are taking this on. And so within Dream Academy communities, and that's similar to what you're describing, we also anchor our programs with universities and local businesses and um, other community groups. So it's not just Dream Academy themselves, it's a whole group of people whom we have been working with and have a like mindset. And so as young people are working on their projects and the institutions within these communities, because while we are in very high-risk communities, they're generally surrounded by these really large universities. So there's a lot of resource and access within a, within a short um, distance. What we're trying to do is create these pathways of connection so that there we build in the sustainability within their own community. We're embedded inside of Title I schools. And so within those school systems, we're also working with the districts to try to build in its own sustainability. And the mentoring piece is key to this. So it's mentors come from outside and within the community, and they help to bring in these resources. So as we make connections, um, a key piece of this is how we're building social capital for young people and those relationships that then 
build into um, getting those these ideas and programs more institutionalized within the institutions within their communities so that they can live on long after long after we're gone. I think your question around how can the government help, I think is while they were here, we were working on trying to uh, you know, talk with some of our leaders on Capitol Hill to really talk about the importance of equipping our young people to be prepared for this fourth industrial revolution. Where we have we see huge gaps in the market right now in terms of young people being able to compete and be prepared for these jobs. So, our government is going to have to come alongside uh, particularly communities that don't have as much resources to pour more resources in specifically around how we train kids from a very young age to begin thinking in this different way that our economy is, is working and operating. And again, universities can be a key piece of that teaching and growing and learning. And so how we can equip our, our communities, our universities, and our districts with the resources to be able to help young people to be prepared for the fourth industrial revolution, which is upon us. <laughs> and then this, uh, getting our young people to other parts of the world to be able to see um, what's outside of that, how they become global leaders is a key piece. To your question about celebrities, absolutely. We think they're, it's great to raise awareness. Um, sometimes it can be a distraction, but you know, oftentimes um, the celebrities that you see more and more right now, celebrities who really want to have more meaningful impact, not just sort of you know, be a flyby. So I think that if, you, if uh, celebrities can help in bringing awareness, uh, but it is a little bit of a, a careful walk ensuring that their message and their brand and what they want to do is aligned with um, the work that you want to do. And, and I think for nonprofits, just being clear about really what the impact is, what can they really, what can they really do? Are they in it for the long haul? Do we just want them to come through and help us raise awareness? Because that's a key piece. That's hard for us to do as nonprofits when you don't have a big budget, a big publicity and marketing and communications budget. Sometimes you need those people with their name and credibility to help you get that message out. And so that's, that is a key um, component of the work as well. Thank you. Would you like the last word? Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I like sometimes the last word. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm getting amused for two things, because Dan said she'll, she'll give the Dream Academy perspective. Double gave the African and the grassroots perspective. So I'm going to conclude with a global perspective. So in short, uh, just to inform you, I'm one of the youngest uh, Aspen Fellows uh, from, uh, from uh, Kenya. And uh, uh, Peter Riley got me into the program. And uh, uh, Willow uh, came to the event. And uh, we had a good time there. As you know, Aspen has uh, a text-based curriculum. So there are some things uh, we'll pick from there. And, uh, and uh, the second thing is, uh, is uh, we, we, we also look into China in some form of technology from Alibaba uh, uh, Group. Uh, I'm also one of the fellows from uh, eFounders by Jack Ma of Alibaba. I think he's working closely now with uh, Melinda Gates in a program and uh, to do with global health. So we will get some form of technology and processes from Alibaba. They are agreeable to work with 100 Mandela's. And then uh, sp speaking of, uh, of uh, so IFC uh, World Bank has a program called 100 uh, African Startups. And that uh, we, we're going to uh, also, we've started engaging them to, to work with us. Because as much as uh, we want to localize Mandela or the Mandela message, we want to also globalize uh, his message. So we, we don't want to keep Mandela to ourselves. Even if he's our, our own, we want to share him uh, with the rest of the world. So in different high schools in, uh, around the world, we'll also create uh, books that kids can understand. And uh, we'll try and use a lot the voice of Ndabo Mandela, because he speaks like him sometimes walks like him, and I think he's the same height as him. <laughs> so we will create some things for the kids to understand. And I've tried this already out in a school called Silverton Public School. It's in Silverton, Colorado. And uh, for the last four months, I've been in a school called United World College. They have 17 campuses around the world. They believe in uh, creating world leaders. And uh, I've been testing and trying some things with them uh, before we, we launch them. But ideally, we're preparing them for the, the new world uh, order, if you might call, call it that way. Now, to the question uh, about celebrities. 
In, when I was in the U.S. between 2001 and 2009, I had my fair chance of uh, hanging out with celebrities, <laughs> and uh, even Bono himself. So I want to give you an example. So I, I, wanna, I, I used to sing, and I can sing, and, uh, and uh, I believed in this idea of uh, stopping malaria, ending malaria. So we went with uh, Bono to several places. There's an organization called World Vision, and there's also a global fund to fight malaria, AIDS, and tuberculosis. And there's also a beautiful organization called One.org. Yeah, you know One.org? So I'll make a joke, because when I was a kid, I had a twin sister, and the only number I could count is until one. And for four years in my primary school, I was number 34 out of 34. <laughs> but I recovered that, and I became number one out of number one for the remaining times in my school. So that's so, so right. So my twin sister, <laughs> yeah, so, so my twin sister is now a professor at University of Cape, I mean, at uh, Wits University in South Africa. And I'm an entrepreneur uh, who I decided to retire at 40. But Anyway, so Bono, we used to do things, and we were called, if you look online, we were called the malaria griot. Who, who knows the griot? Are you familiar with the term griots? Uh, have you ever heard of any West African? Uh, they sing. Exactly, because that's what we believe in. So I was named by one.org to be their leading griot. So we went to so many places with Bono, and, uh, and I think it's called Gabriel, some Peter Gabriel, so some of these uh, musicians who believe in in the Band-Aid and all these kind of things. But I think that time is gone. It was good for that time, but Africans have also grown, and we want to share our own message with our own accents, because she teases me a lot sometimes <laughs> about my accent, and we want to speak loudly, clearly, and authoritatively about our problems, how we want to partner with our friends and different organizations, so we want to do that. And, uh, and, uh, we, and we, we may continue to need sometimes their voices. I was also a beneficiary of Clinton Global Initiative in the sense that uh, he made me the first um, African member uh, way back when they got started. So I've been able to get access, but I want to convert that access to collaboration and to scale for the benefit of Africa. And in, when I mean Africa, I mean the 54 legal states in Africa and the diaspora. And, and in that in mind, Ndaba clearly, because before he would tell me we want the 100 Mandela's to cover Brazil, but I was not understanding why Brazil, and it's, it's really out of Africa. But if you read about Pangea, you know, Pangea and the way the tectonics shifts up, and there are a lot of Africans in Brazil, right? And so we've extended our, our hands to work with them uh, into the future. And, uh, and nothing communicates to any African kid like soccer. And Brazilians are extremely good at that. So we want to uh, shoot out this HIV AIDS and create a lasting bridge with also dream so that we can make uh, our wish and uh, work come true. And for the lady at the back who says she does her real work after work, come and join us with uh, creating 100 Mandela's. So God bless you all and thank you. It just, it just remains for me to thank not only Ndaba, but Diane and Teddy for gracing uh, our stage here. So please join me in thanking them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. I'm going to steal your water. <laughs>